through the question <coughs> that Travis gave me and hopefully it ignites more questions for you. Um, hope you don't mind me drink coffee while I'm talking. <laughs> it's kind of the songwriting thing, right? Um, definitely a hill song anyway. Every, it's kind of the uh, necessary um, accompaniment. <laughs> so, um, yeah, basically, um, in terms of Hillsong, um, Travis just asked me to give a little bit of an intro as to how it started, and um, I'm sure you guys have heard the CDs and stuff. I think what is, um, sometimes people don't really realize is that it's very much a church, and um, that the music comes out of the life of the church, and, and that that's very much a part of how things um, have become so influential and why they're so influential uh, and how it's changed other churches. So basically, um, a little congregation started 45 people in a um, kind of a, a kind of semi-rural town um, that was starting to become a suburban kind of area. And that was the Hills District. And so 45 people kind of... Um, headed out towards that area and started a little church in a school hall. And um, basically, that was Brian and Bobby, who were the senior pastors, and also a team of people. Um, yeah, so because I started in a little kind of suburban area, um, a group of people kind of started to meet, and they... Um, is it on? It's all good? Yep, you're good, you're good. I just forgot okay. to make it full screen, so I'm going to do that right now. Okay, no worries. That's fine. Um, yeah, so I think the one thing that was really unusual um, to that area of Sydney was charismatic worship. And so they were um, influenced from New Zealand and um, a very free kind of style of worship that was really focused on the spirit. Um, right in the middle of the time when I guess um, Sydney churches had very much rejected the charismatic movement. So... Um, the Angl most of the Anglican churches today in Sydney are still cessationists, so they believe that the Holy Spirit or the, the acts of the Holy Spirit finished with um, the end of the Bible, that the Holy Spirit doesn't move in the church today. So um, that's the context in which Hillsong kind of emerged. And the songs became a little bit of a resistance song, I guess, um, against that theology and became something that was um, people would sing to... I guess, uh, allow them to connect with the Spirit in worship. And so in some ways, I think that's maybe why it was so influential um, at the time and why the songs traveled so quickly. So my parents were in an Anglican church and it was um, they were really longing for um, leadership that really embraced the Spirit. They had um, become born again and so they were really wanting to explore some of the things that, um, some of the influence that was coming into Australia from America. So they um, decided to leave their church and to go to Hillsong. So I would have been probably about seven. So um, the songs were, um, the, the theologies of, of Hillsong were really not embraced. The songs were really embraced. So they became really, um, really, really popular. So basically it was a way to get people singing about the spirit, was a way to, that Hillsong writers felt that they were... Um, getting people to talk about the spirit and it was working amazingly. So my parents turned up at the church um, and they were very passionate about um, the Holy Spirit and about seeing a freer kind of worship style in Sydney's churches. Um, and I think, um, you know, so I turned up as a seven-year-old and grew up in the church. Um, I... Yeah, we basically um, just joined the youth group and um, it was the children's ministry first for my brother and I and um, he played piano and I was a singer and then we kind of grew up with the team. So I'm pretty much the same age as Joel Houston um, and so we went through children's ministry together and, um, you know, did renditions of like, <laughs> Moses parting the Red Sea and, <laughs> you know, crazy stuff like that. So um, I'm kind of, I, I feel like I'm very much a part of the fabric of the church. Um, when I started, it was probably around a thousand people. And now it's probably in Australia alone about 25,000. So it's grown enormously over that time. 
And I think most people would recognise the music long before they actually recognised the church. So um, definitely the music has been part of that growth. And I've had a really influential part in play, to play in that in those regards. So um, in terms of how Hillsong got started, I think probably um, the most important um, kind of parts of the story, I'll just outline those. So um, Brian and Bobby are pastors who are really passionate about music and about worship and the power of worship. Um, so I think that is a really key. It's I go to churches all the time and they want to become Hillsong. Like they ask me, you know, how can we be Hillsong? And I think that ultimately um, to have a really um, a great worship ministry, you really have to have it in the heart of the senior pastors or the senior leadership. Um, so that's something that, you know, is really very true of Hillsong. Bobby, um, it just really is very encouraging to the writers. And Brian, you know, has been a songwriter and written the most, some of the funniest songs Hillsong has released have, have been written by Brian. So I think he wrote a song on this obscure scripture, which was heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. <laughs> and um, I, I don't think any other songwriter would attempt to unpack that one, but, you know, it's one of his, um, his yeah, songs in the early days. Tanya, I noticed on some of the first Hillsong records that Brian Houston was the writer of most of the songs, and I found that yeah. interesting. Yeah, and definitely, I think he really was very strategic in choosing, you know, the people who he put around himself who had the same vision and who were willing to put some of those um, things together into, um, into, into songs. So I think he was really strategic about that and they really felt like it was a real, it was a mandate and even, you know, Probably when I was doing my master's interviews with the leaders that had been really in, um, influential in creating Hillsong, all almost all of them said we are we are called by God to do this. They um, weren't at all unsure about that calling. So it was something that both Brian really knew in his heart they were meant to do, and that confirmed. So I think you know that led really to. Um, Jeff Bullock was one of the early writers and he was very influential at Hillsong. He um, basically wrote most of the songs um, and I think he had a really unique style that was really kind of, um, it really appealed to a lot of different groups. So it was kind of in, you know, really contemporary language so young people could and then um, really kind of, just melody, really great melody that I think was pretty universal. So I and I think that's something that we can really learn um, is that there are musics that don't divide the church, but that unify them. And those are, are, are really important for songwriters to chase after in, in wanting to find melodies and find ways of putting it that unite people groups. So and I think he did that really well. So. But basically they just started making tapes and distributing them from the garage of someone's house and um, it became kind of a phenomenon. So I know that um, in terms of the publishing aspects of things, you know, there was a lot of collaboration between people who were businessmen and who really felt like they really wanted to get these songs out and also the songwriters. So it was very much a community effort. Uh, in that regard, and I think that you know any songwriter would agree. There's, you know, you can sit and write the best song on earth, but ultimately, it has to find its audience and to find its, you know, the people that really, you know, it's intended for. And so I think in that regard, there's a lot to be said for the businessmen of Hillsong who really were very passionate about the songs and supporting them, getting them out. So yeah. And then I think, um, you know, so in terms of like, so the next probably really big phase that was really important was Darlene coming in. She was hugely influential and I know you guys have heard from her, which is such an honour. It's actually quite amazing that she was able to do that. 
and how busy she is. So, um, yeah, I think the one thing that was really um, controversial again about her ministry was that she was a woman and um, Integrity really didn't want to release women worship leaders. They really struggled with that um, notion. And it kind of, as she said, it was a complete accident and something that she didn't necessarily want, um, but that really felt called to do and it ultimately and that God had really orchestrated it. And Katie, After- just, just to give a background, just so that I have the history right and so our students understand, yes. this is a pretty pivotal moment. Integrity had arranged with your church in 1996 to release an album. Obviously, somebody had come over, Jeff's songs had made waves. We knew the power of your love. We were singing that over here in the late 90s. And uh, other songs, This Kingdom. and So yeah. so there's obviously something generated enough to get their interest. And they yes. uh, they go over there. And Jeff, as far as they know, was going to lead the night. And then as Darling told us, she ended up stepping in. But uh, yeah. do you know any history on how that relationship with Integrity, how, how Hillsong was discovered by yeah. them? Because that's in North America, we know his song via integrity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a guy, um, Russell Frager, who was one of the, he was kind of a music director and um, really influential in setting up that um, kind of core team. He and the business manager of Hillsong Church travelled over to America, and they did kind of, um, they had realised that the songs were just becoming so popular in Australia that um, record labels were coming to them and saying, we really want to distribute that you. And they felt like they really needed to find out more about the industry and what they should and what parts they should and shouldn't take. So they did a three-week tour throughout the US and just gathering as much information as they could. They went and saw every... Um, every church that was releasing music and they observed it um, and tried to just get as much information as possible. And I think they came away realizing that what happens in America often is that a, a church helps grow a worship leader to it, to their, you know, this potential where they've got something that is a voice that is really important for the church. And then a record label will often come in and take that artist and put them on the road. So they will record and then that person will tour. And so the person's taken out of the context in which that song emerged. And they felt like there were a lot of those models that were occurring. And what they really wanted to do was offer something different. So to say worship leaders come out of context and that context is with their song and so um, you can't remove them record with them and take them on the road because basically the church it's the church's song and there's something really important about that dialogue so I think you know that that was actually I mean we're talking like 80s what 80 like maybe maybe it was 90 it would have it would have it, it may not have even been in the 90s so I think in that sense it was really um quite forward thinking. So that and I think that's really that's very much how Hillsong does it. So they, you know, rather than going, you know, what we want to model the industry, they go, okay, so how can we sit down and figure out what we're called to do and how we can do that in a way that really allows us to continue to be who we are. And I think that's a really um that's been a really big thing because they decided to change this model. So basically they said to Integrity, you know, um, well, if you record with us, you're not going to get our worship leader isn't going to tour. We, the church will tour. So we'll take a band. We'll take, you know, our um, pastors. We, but we'll do it as a mission. And so I think, you know, for them it really has become more of a mission. I think it's probably more normal now to see that, but at the time it definitely wasn't at all. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so they basically, um, so Darlene then, so she was meant to be one of the backing singers for this project and then the worship, Jeff um, told me that he basically had, had this um, really unease in the lead up to the album and he really had been wanting to leave. He felt like the celebrity and everything had gotten too much. Um, And it was, he really, he said to me that he really struggled with insecurity 
and that that was exacerbated by the fame. And I think that is something that was is really poignant for songwriters. I think there's this insecurity within every single one of us that could ultimately take over the gift. And um, and I I really I was so grateful that he said that you know because I think that portion of us could really it really could undermine what we're meant to do. So. Um, and he has, like, you know, regrets about stepping down now, but I think at the same time he felt like he couldn't sustain it and it was the right time to hand over. But every time he tried to um, hand over, it was never the right time because everything was so busy and going so fast. So he basically just, he said that he basically um, set up all the rehearsals knowing full well that Darlene was going to be the one leading the, rehe- um, leading the album. So Russell Frager found out um, a couple of days before the album that Jeff wasn't going to turn up and um, he had to meet with the Integrity guys and say, we're really sorry but our worship leader won't be coming. And, um, and then he also had to say, look, but you know, Darlene can take this. Darlene is more than competent, able to do this. Um, and so the Integrity guys really reluctantly allowed her to worship lead the album. Um, and I think, you know, she's so, so humble um, it's not at all, you know, something that she, um, she, she just never wanted that kind of fame or anything. So I think, you know, her, it was a mistake. I think, um, what happened though really was something that I've really learned from Darlene's leadership, which is that, um, she really just has this art of going on and worshiping God despite what is happening around her and just a real focus on the Holy Spirit and what he's doing in the, in, um, in worship and in people's lives. And so I think, you know, she just got out and did what she does. <laughs> and I, I think, you know, the rest is kind of history. Um, the next kind of point in the making of Hillsong, I guess, was really the United Band. So, and that's kind of where, I'm most, you know, comfortable to speak to having been, you know, I was in the choir, I think, for the Shouts of the Lord album, but um, it wasn't, I definitely wasn't at a point where that was, you know, I was influential in the decision making, more of an observer. So I think, you know, we'd grown up with, when, when this happened, when Integrity really came in and the album started to go global, there was this sense of suddenly we realised that the whole world was watching. Um, as a second generation in, in the movement of God, I think there's something really, um, it's a choice as to whether you really push through and become, um, whether you continue, I guess, this movement and um, or whether you resist it. And I think the group of people that I grew up with were just really passionate for God. We were, we were so... Um, we knew that there was this fame and all of these other stuff that was associated with the music business and it was never, ever, ever, ever motivated out of that. And I think that's really the key. You know, even now when, you know, now that I'm here in the States and doing my PhD, really ultimately I just, it's really about finding that place where you get with God and where it's where creativity comes out of a response to his grace. And and it, it really honestly... Finding that place becomes more and more difficult, but it becomes more and more of a discipline, and I really think that's the spiritual discipline of songwriting. So um, really, we kind of did these summer camps every January, and um, we had, like, it was crazy. You know, we danced until we couldn't dance any longer. Like, you know, it was kind of like in these crazy hot tents and... um, and so I think, you know, we, we started by introducing delirious songs, you know, British rock bands and, uh, you know, just really that sound was much more appealing to me, much more appealing to, you know, the people that kind of, we, you know, were with. And, um, and basically what happened was, you know, it just created this revival ultimately. Basically the, the kids just would not stop singing, would not stop dancing. And um, as the band, you know, we were at the point where we were like, could you just give us a break? We just really want to go and sleep. But um, they were just so excited, you know, to be worshipping God and so genuinely passionate for it that we just got to this point where and I remember Ruben had this meeting and um, with the, like, the guys and, and he just went, 
like we were worshiping maybe like three to four hours a section and we were like it was an entire week of this you know and he just went we've run out of songs <laughs> and um and he was like we have to pray that god will give us new songs because i'm so sick of these songs <laughs> and so um basically you know i think that's where really we started writing was out of a sense of we need new songs to to really carry this um, anointing and this sense of freedom in God's presence and to honour what God was doing in our midst that was unique. And I think, again, like that is something that is universal. There's lots that is not universal out of Hillsong's story and that people try to model. But I think there's, you know, there's, there is something really important about writing songs that really validate what God is doing in the midst of a people. And so they could be songs about, you know, how God is moving in terms of compassion for the poor or, you know, or they could be songs, that, you know, that are for other specific tasks. For us, it was all about dancing and about freedom and about really just getting to a place where um, we let go of all of those that can – all of the stuff was really weighing down on us. You know, it wasn't, um, it, I think, you know, Australia is so remote to the rest of the world that probably it's not really very easy for Americans to understand. Um, we watched, you know, we had seven television stations and five of those had American shows. So you can imagine how much it felt like we were in a backwater looking on the world and very powerless very um, detached. There was there's a sense of you know a lot of the kids were from broken homes. A lot of the kids had domestic violence. You know a lot of the kids were lost. And you know the greatest thing to do in Castle Hill on a weekend was to get drunk. You know it was that kind of a place. And in amongst all of that, there was a sense of no, I'm choosing to really focus on God and to really dedicate my life to Him. So that's where the songs kind of come out of. And, you know, some of the really great tunes that really move the heart of our congregation, you know, I'm thinking of my Samson's Carry Me. You know, like probably some of the songs that maybe are not circulated in America were really huge. Um, there was like these rap songs that came out that were just about having fun, you know. Um, there's a couple in like um, probably 2003, which probably you guys didn't even know, but um, some of the rap songs like Soldier, you know, emerged out of the time of, you um, like it was war, basically, you know, war was declared. And so there was this sense of how do we make sense of it? You know, we're actually, we're in an army already. So, um, but yeah, there's so many different songs. I think um, I wrote this song that, you know, now is quite a time ago. I just too a weird noise that's coming through. But anyway, <laughs> um, I about a long time ago, um, but Hear Our Prayer, which was really just about that encounter, about being on our knees and um, really praying for um, God to move in our midst and really being open to that and um, attentive to that in our midst. And, um, yeah, I think, like, you know, there's so many songs and each of them brought a really prophetic moment and um yeah which i'm sure is what all of you guys are um you know striving towards as well <laughs> can you can you tell us a little bit about the uh the songwriting process that you'd experience with hillsong united how songs would come about maybe how they were brought to the team and then later how they would be tested and and selected to be on projects sure okay so um i think every song is completely different uh, uh, there's no it's really Journalists really want, you know, the process. I think there isn't a process. I think um, every song is a unique baby. Russell Frager said to me once, you know, every song is like a child and they grow up and they travel around the world and they send you postcards. But it's not like that you can control them. So I think, you know, in terms of the process, there's probably a lot more process now than what there was then. Um, basically, we tested the songs in the youth group. So um, a lot of the songs, like every day, um, was like completely early, something that was, it, it had resonance with the youth community. Um, you know, thinking about some of the newer songs as well, you know, that's very much true. The song Cornerstone that's about to be released um, on the newest album. No, like it 
to it. So every single service, we would try and introduce a new song. So we would do like maybe like five songs in a set and one of those would be a new song every time. And I think that was really based in the commitment towards new songs. Um, and also just a realisation that it was a risk. So some songs you know, really are very immediately successful. Others need revision. Um, and, you know, others will never come back again. I remember this one song, which was called Reuben Wrote, and it was from a psalm, and it was All Our Fountains Are In You. And he just thought it was the most beautiful imagery, you know, like fountains and basically like this, the church just stood there like they just thought, they just did not get it. Like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And I think, you know, even though it was the most beautiful of song, you know, our debrief after the after the meeting was, yeah, that one's not going to ever come out again. <laughs> I think, you know, I, you know, the guys who have the most songs on the album took the most risks. They were the ones that, you know, put out the the songs that were, you know, risky, and they gave it a shot. And I think um, that element is never going to be minimised, and um, never ever going to get away from the fact that ultimately presenting a song is a risk. So. Um, but in the early days, we would present them and the church would basically decide. It would be like, you know, they would, they, they had their ways of showing us, you know. It was like that all our fountains are in you, dead silence, you know. Whereas other songs, it was like immediately like, you know, they just were like worshipping and found some really, um, some new revelation in. So I think that's one aspect of the process at Hillsong. You know, now in, in later years, um, Robert Ferguson edits the songs for theology um, and that process is, um, like, yeah, I can send through the article that it outlines that process. Basically, there's an email address that we send our songs to and um, it's kind of, it's not well known. Um, like, you have to, there's all of these lists, you know, like, you really do have to be a part of the church community. Um they're not looking for people who are brilliant um, but not committed. They're not looking for um, songwriters who are not have who does who don't have the church's best interests at heart. Um, I think they're really um, just looking for people who really have the same spirit, which is basically they would serve week in and week out without the published song gives I guess the right to maybe to maybe submit your songs for publishing. So, and then, yeah, I guess as well, like theological and biblical commitments. <laughs> Sorry, you're going to ask a question, Charles. Yeah, I was just, you can see when I'm getting antsy. Um, <laughs> I was just going to ask, could you, um, w when you're thinking back and kind of visiting back in your mind, what are some songs that maybe through your, now that you're here in America, you realized had come from your church that, were, that have become popular over here, that at the time when they were introduced, you can remember, oh yeah, the congregation did respond well to this. Are there, are there specific songs? That, and I know in the past we've also talked about specific projects that you just felt, oh, God yeah. was all over this project. And we have about five or six minutes left, but maybe talk, maybe talk a little bit about that. I think that'd be Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I think Hosanna, the song Hosanna um, by Brooke Fraser was something that was really prophetic at the time. Um, you know, it's funny, in America I've noticed that a lot of the churches, um, don't necessarily, like, I think it kind of polarizes the church. <laughs> so there are some that absolutely adore the song and some that it just doesn't work with. Um, but in our church, that was just such a picture of the days of United Live. It, it managed to capture a future forward um, image of what, to our church, worship really was, which was that, um, just every, you know, this sense of a revival, that this sense of a renewal of the spirit in our midst. Um, but it's still also it's really um, biblically based and, you know, really committed to evangelical theology. So I think um, that was one. Um, oh, gosh, I'm just like having a look through them. Um, oh, Saviour King. I don't know if that's huge here, but oh, my goodness. Like that song just released something amazing into our church. It was like... This sense of like a really hymn like melody structure, something that really kind of again drew, um, dug into the past, but also just really was very future forward looking. And um, you can, as a worship leader, you can really prophesy that song across, you know, into a community and really just 
seeing it. Um, and I think that's something that's really amazingly powerful. That is just really <laughs> cheapest. Um, I think also Mighty to Save. That song, um, although now I'm starting to go, that song is just so overdone. But um, it's like in this, it's in a tween period where it's not quite cool again. I don't think, you know, it's like, oh. But um, I think just really beautiful, fresh sense of evangelism, you know, and, and going, we're really committed to it, but we're committed to it in fresh ways. It's not going to look like it did 10 years ago. It's going to look new. And um, just really singing that into our midst and going, um, you know what, God, you are mighty to save, but, it, it, you know, we're not going to try and hold to the formulas of who you were to us, you know, in previous eras. Um, definitely that's what that song contributed. You know, um, I'm trying to think, like, oh, in some in the latest album, um, there's a whole heap, but um, Take Heart um, on the you know, Aftermath album, um, just amazing like like an avalanche rhythms of grace there's something really amazing about the aftermath project um we really felt like there was this real it kind of it got very stale and we kind of were at this point where i was going oh my goodness you know what now darlene had moved on and there was a sense of like what is the new song and you know is it what what are where is your song going you know and i think the church was a little bit not unsettled but just waiting you know for that project and so when it really came I think you know there's a sense of like oh just relief you know <laughs> here are these great songs prophetic to our community and and you know without Darlene it still continues and that's very much what Hillsong is based on it's not personality based it's very much about the community and the church and um, so I think that just really brought real reassurance of God's love and you know a sense that it's all going to be good <laughs> Dallas can be involved in like her amazing church and projects and you know Hillsong is still going to be okay God hasn't left us so I think you know that's a couple um, but yeah I mean it's so hard because they're all so um, anointed and timely and I, yeah <laughs> that's, that's awesome we got just a couple minutes here um, mm -hmm. This has been so helpful because I think um, we've had a lot of speakers on Skype that have talked about the, uh, the the details in terms of building a song and, and, and how they do that. Paul Balash, who's just so great, was, awesome. was, was Skyping in a couple of weeks ago, and Twyla Paris yeah. has Skyped in, and, and of course Darlene has. Um, yeah. but this has been good just to hear the journey behind the song, and one of the things that kind of stood out to me, and I don't know if this resonated with you guys, but just the whole forward thinking, like just always thinking about the next thing, not being kind of stuck on what's been expressed before, and, and just really trusting that God has a, a new word, a prophetic word for the, for for a new yes. season, for a new generation. What is what is maybe one or two things, uh, words of encouragement, just really quick that you could leave with our writers yeah. today? Yeah, I think you know from the perspective of someone who is a worship writer, I think um, you know my husband and I have just been reflecting on how easy it is to let. Um, other, people other people create a model that you try and be, but you're so unique. And, and I think, you know, when we really get to that place, we recognize there's no competition. It's not a competition between, you know, who writes the best song. I think God breathes on the right song in the right moment. And But really, to be true to what God's put inside of you is really the greatest um, and most important uh, responsibility that he has on us. And, you know, we just keep thinking, like, we're not going to get held to account for Darlene's ministry when we get to heaven. I'm not going to get held account for, to account for that. I'm going to be held account to account for Tanya's ministry. And um, I think, you know, and that's really what's led me into, you know, listening to our Aboriginal people and to working and praying towards reconciliation in our nation. Um, it's just that really a sense of, this is my time. We're all, we all have for such a time as this. And so, you know, I think for you guys as well, this is your time. And um, definitely, like, gleaning from, you know, this amazing course that Travis has put together is really important. But, um, yeah, just to go, okay, who am I? And what is it that I bring? And what is it that I can say that no one else could say? And I think even more so as we globe, as the world globalizes, that's so important. Like what community are you from? What are the sounds of that community? You know, I think about, you know, the sounds that I grew up with and what it is to be Australian. What is it to be from your city? What is it to be from your community? And I think, you know, 
that is really, really becoming more and more important. So, yeah, be you. God make you you. That's so good. Thank you, Tanya, thank you so much. You've been so gracious. Can we give her a round of applause? For that? Um, Tanya, I know you're so gracious and humble and you would never do this, but I, I would like you, would you take 10 seconds and just tell them about your latest project because you are a wonderful writer and I know that you are embarking on some new exciting things and I think these guys would like to check out your website and, and yeah, learn a little bit sure. about it. So give us a commercial. Yeah, so um, basically I wrote my latest project is called Grace. It was a collaboration. I deliberately chose to work with six um, songwriters from different denominations in my city of Sydney and um, knowing that you know the divisions between you know those who believe in the spirit those who don't I really chose to do something ecumenic and we really wrote with the purpose in mind that um, all people would really be able to sing it but particularly those who were going through a grieving period or who um, you know were really just in the lows of life as well as the highs and to try and unify those so I wrote it in the midst of um, interviewing 200 people with a disability. I worked as a research assistant and so the songs really were birthed out of that place of what would it be to be a mother of a child with a disability and how could I, inter like, how could I sing and worship from that place. So some of the songs are just amazing, you know, there's this track, Lord of My Heart, that was written, um, that was sung by um, a beautiful songwriter called Nathan Tasker two days after he lost his babies. His wife had a miscarriage and he sang the song. Like it is just an amazing project. So um, yeah, it's really just the start. I think we're really trying to, um, you know, when I'm moving into this whole reconciliation and how to really um, put lyrics and melodies to things that have caused division in the past. So. This is, yeah, Grace, and um, yeah, my, my website is just tannyriches.org, and you can, it's not completely updated yet, I'm in the middle of a PhD, but um, yeah, you can definitely get it online, and also in iTunes, so yeah. Tanya, let me quickly pray for you. We love you, and we hope, hopefully we can do this again. This has been so helpful. I, I feel as though it's just been way too short. And uh, yes. I, I got the women in the back of the room nodding their heads. I think they really oh, resonated awesome. with a lot of Good things. Good girls. So, I love it. So, awesome. Let me pray for you really quickly. Lord Jesus, yes. thank you today for the way that you use, use Tanya. Lord, even from a little girl, the songs and the melodies that you've put in her heart, Lord, that have given a language to respond to you uh, for people all over the world. And we thank you, Lord, for the way that you used her in Hillsong. And Lord, for the way that you're using her now here in the States at Fuller. And we just pray blessings upon her and her husband. Lord, that you just give them favor. Lord, that you would cause her to... Uh, to complete her PhD and through that process, Lord, that you continue to uh, birth new songs and give her new ideas and new melodies, Lord, that would help shape the worship culture and help give people a language to respond to you. Thank you for the giftings. Lord, thank you for her mind and the way that you've developed her mind and even the interest that she has taken in the historicity of this and the benefit that it is now to us as we learn from her. Lord, bless her and keep her, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless you guys as well. I'll be praying that your songs are amazing. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. I'll be emailing you soon. God bless you. All right. See ya. Ciao. See ya.